Um, what we'll do is we'll go over just a little bit of some of the studies that we found and why we think it's important, and then we'll share our uh, share the results. So um, let's see if I can get this going here. So we think there's really uh, three items that guide our study of commuting habits. Uh, one is workforce attraction. Uh, the other is economic growth. And the last is health and safety of our workforce in our community. So let's uh, break those down a bit. Um, in part, when we look at the future of our workforce, what we think we're really talking about is millennials and in part the post-millennials. And in, so depending on, on who you read, this generation, the millennial generation was born between 1980 to 1995. And that makes them uh, about 25 to 40 years old today in this year. And what is exciting about this group is they're estimated to be about 75 million in the United States. And so we want to show a little bit is here is uh, the 2017 uh, information. And, and the reason it's uh, a little behind is that that's the most recent year for which data is available. But what you see here is primarily in that orange category is that at that time in 2017, there were 56 millennials that were either working or looking for work. And that's more than the 53 million Gen Xers who were about a, quarter, a third of the workforce. And it's well ahead of the 41 million baby boomers who represent a quarter of the total. So again, if we're looking at possibly enticing this population to live and work in Inglewood, and there's a, a large chunk, we think we need to then ask, what are they looking for in, in a community? And one of the things um, maybe you've continued to hear, but we continue to hear about this generation is that they are leaders in the change towards alternative modes of transportation. And that doesn't mean that they still don't use the automobile to travel back and forth. But I think as you can see from this 2020 US Department of Health and Human Services study is that each generation as we go along uses the automobile uh, less and less. And that even goes down to the post millennials or what I believe they're calling them the generation Z. You can see this trend continues. One thing I might point out on here, if you can see that, and hopefully this shows up well, is uh, that's interesting from these, this study and the results that don't really match up with our survey is an increasing number of those that choose uh, carpool as an option. And we just don't see that. And when we share that study, it will bring that up. But one of the reasons that we may be seeing, uh, again, still large numbers of people driving alone or in carpool in part might just be the way that uh, our communities are built to favor the automobile. I'm sure you've heard that before. But what was interesting to us is uh, during we, while we were doing this survey, I received uh, the following email from somebody that wanted to share a little bit more. And when I explored more, I won't share any confidence of, of who this person was, but this person did fall within that millennial group. So if you uh, will indulge me just a bit, I just wanted to read their email. It said, thanks for sending this. I feel like there are some nuances in my answers that couldn't be conveyed in this survey. I rate driving as valuable only because there are essentially no other options in Inglewood, is his opinion. I do commute to work by bike 75% of the time, but given the current infrastructure, lack of safety measures, and car dominance in Inglewood, I just don't see many people taking the risk or putting forth the effort to ride a bike for transportation. I think buses are fantastic, but our bus system is essentially useless. Again, his opinion. I can get where I'm going on my bike in a third of the time it would take me on a bus. So he, sums up, he concludes as saying this. So in short, I'd love to see alternative transportation methods at Inglewood's, as Inglewood's top priority, but people will only start using these options as they are convenient and easy. Part of the equation is making it harder to drive and harder to park. And why I share that 
wanted to share that email is I thought as we were reading some of the research and understanding what this, I thought it, it did illustrate the attitudes of this group of a population of, of upcoming workforce that are looking for more alternatives in their city when where they, they live and work. And so it's not surprising, I guess, when we look at this 2014 Global Strategy Group survey funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, that what millennials value at the very top when they are looking at a community to live and work is the ability to be less reliant on an automobile. And part of that decision is also cost. The cost of owning a car is less appealing to them than things they value. And so this, this global strategy group study asked some additional questions with the following results. A majority of millennials, 70% who currently do not have regular access to a vehicle, say they could not live in the current area where they were living without access to public transportation. And 86% of the millennials say that it is important that their city offer a low cost public transportation system with affordable fares. Uh, this is especially true in this study with millennials who earn less than $30,000 a year. And almost two thirds of millennials, 64%, say that the expense of owning a car is a major reason they want to be less reliant on one. So again, as we look at this and we say, if we are looking to attract millennials to our city and, and they are a growing part of our workforce, we may need to begin to advocate for alternative modes. But I guess the next question for us is what happens when we do this? Are there other benefits besides the attraction of, of this workforce group that's starting to come into our, in our population? And if we move in this direction, you know, what kind of other benefits are there? And there have been many organizations trying to figure this out, trying to tie uh, this multimodal to um, economic growth. And some have used walk scores. And if you are not familiar with the metric of the walk score, it analyzes hundreds of walking routes to nearby amenities and then gives it a score. And so somewhere like Boston has a score of 82 which is in most of the studies is considered desirable. And the, on the other hand, many suburb communities, suburban communities have walk scores of around 20. So for example, Highlands Ranch, just south of us in Inglewood, has, an, has a walk score of 27. And so you'll see in a lot of the reports, at least that we were studying and looking at, they often compare uh, communities with a score of around 80 to a score of around 20. And so just to share a couple of the information that the, the studies that we thought were interesting, in a report by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, they were trying to look at the relationship between communities with walk scores at different levels in economic growth. And what they found is that retail, and that includes restaurants and bars, would often see significant increase in net income for those businesses when they were located in, a, in an area that had a walk score of 80 or above, in contrast to communities with a score of 20 or below. And what they, additionally, what they found is that increase in, in net income was close to 30 to 40%. There was another study done this year by the Victorian Transportation Policy Institute that found that households spend 10% less on transportation when offered more multimodal transportation options. And that study later, uh, deeper into the study, made the point that um, they had not, they were interested in determining with that uh, additional disposable income, would those families then spend that locally to the places they could walk and could uh, bike or uh, simply take other forms of transit. And then this last study that I thought was really interesting was various real estate firms have been trying to understand the relationship between walk scores and home prices. They have seen some relationship, but they wanted to quantify it a bit. 
And what they seem to all agree on is that an increase in walkability means an increase in housing prices. What is interesting, but what, what is interesting in the report is that a 1% increase has a different effect in different areas. So for example, an increase from 19 to 20 in your walk score may only increase your home price by $100. But an increase from a 79 to 80 often has an increase of over $7,000. And so there seems to be some economic benefit to having a more walkable community. And the next question you may ask is, where is Inglewood in all of this? And so going to the walk score website, which you can do, Inglewood is considered somewhat walkable. We're around a 62. And so that's in contrast with Littleton that is at a 39 or Denver with a walk score of 61. Uh, Aurora is at a 43 and Westminster, for example, is at 35. So there's all kinds of different walk scores, but I think what this suggests for us, if 80 is a preferable walk score to attract this uh, workforce and others, is that there is some room for Englewood to grow and to increase its walk score. And so last of all, what we wanted to um, talk about is, is health and safety. And I think for many of us, it seems obvious that an active commute is healthier than a non-active commute. And it seems like the data supports this notion. The American Journal of Preventive Medicine suggests that as walkability increases in a community, the risk of obesity decreases. And they quantified that 8% for women and 13% for men. And as the Journal of American Heart Association did another study in 2019, that indicates that people in less walkable neighborhoods were up to 33% more likely to have cardiovascular risks compared to people living in walkable neighborhoods. And then I think we've all heard many times that there are also environmental factors to using our car, cars less, that walking, cycling, and transit options can help reduce carbon dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, in particulate matter, we're, we're all probably familiar with the Denver brown cloud and what we all try to do to read the steps we take to reduce those elements within our own airstream. As well as walking, cycling, and other options can reduce noise pollution and wear and tear on our roads. But there's one uh, thing that I wanted to share that, uh, one of the concerns that was suggested by that person that emailed us back when we were doing this study, as well as, um, and it really has to do with the safety of cycling. And the De US Department of Transportation has also started to, to look at these, uh, to look at fatality rates as it relates to cycling to better understand the safety of cycling in our, in our communities. As cycling and walking begin to rise, um, they were interested in understanding how, understanding how safe that is as a transportation option. And so I wanted to share some of this data collected by the DOT. Um, they collect data for communities that are uh, 600,000 and up. So Englewood did not fall into that area, but Denver did. So I thought that was an interesting data point. And in this chart, what I think is surprising and what we can look at is, is that a larger population does not always equate to greater fit, fight fatalities. That if we look at Austin, for example, I mean, Austin around nine, 900,000 has a fatality of one per 100,000 of the population. And somewhere, example like Denver, has close to uh, eight, fatal eight fatalities of pedicyclists for per 100, uh, for the population, 100,000 population. And so some have suggested, uh, I think Lindsay even mentioned when she saw this chart, well, that's really interesting. Why is someone like Austin only at one and someone like Albuquerque down at, whoops, down at 12? 
And some have suggested that this is the result more of protected bike lanes, bike traffic lights, and education for both the biking community and those that drive. There is some, uh, there might be some degree of weather related uh, accidents as well, but I think we are probably within this list, the snowiest community in Denver than uh, any of the other communities. And so what I guess this indicates to us is if as a community and as, as businesses in that community, we begin to advocate for these types of multimodal transportation modes, that we still need to consider safer biking lanes, biking safety education, as more people begin to use these forms of commuting. And so that's really the end of, of the presentation on just kind of why we think this is important. So what it seems to us is that studying how our workforce uh, commutes provides an opportunity for additional workforce attraction to our community, economic growth, and the health and safety of our community. Is that, is everybody able to see that? I think so. We can see it. Great. And so this is kind of what, what we found. And again, um, our intention was to try to create a baseline by which we could compare future studies with the intent of, of doing a, a similar study, a commuter survey st study uh, each year and see uh, where we're, we're growing or declining in various areas of commutes, commuting habits and benefits. And so um, we had 87 people, 87 participants fill this out. Um, the, other, the other part that um, we can kind of look at and maybe to give this some kind of uh, measure, measuring against others is to look at the um, difference between what we have and what uh, the Downtown Denver Partnership in, in 2019 did a similar study and we can kind of post um, measure our results against them. Now I understand they're a bigger community and have a lot of different, but right now there's um, nothing that we've found to measure where we're at to where we could be. And so the first interesting difference is the people that drive alone. You'll see in our study, we had 83% of our commuters that said that they drove alone. The downtown Denver partnership survey indicated that 32% of those people. We also recognize that um, doing this survey in, you know, 2022, 2021 probably has some pandemic effect as well. But uh, still, these might be some interesting uh, numbers to look at. Inglewood's bike to work is at 1.19%, where Denver survey indicates that 9% uh, of their workforce bikes to work. And our walk is a, at three and a half, and Denver indicates that there's, uh, their commuters walk, 5% uh, of their commuters walk to work. Where I think there's a really big difference in the transit is the transit numbers. Um, our transit number survey suggests that again, one 1.19% uh, 1, 1 uh, use transit, where in the Denver survey, um, the 43% of the people uh, commute in or commute out of Denver for their work environment. The other thing that we, we indicated that you'll see here too, uh, is the commuting habits. Um, people living in Inglewood, but working in other cities, their average commute is around 7.6 miles. Uh, people living in Inglewood and working in Inglewood, their average commute is uh, 3.2. And the average one-way commute distance for employees working in Inglewood, but living outside of the city, um, of commuting into Inglewood is, is uh, 10 miles. And what I think is interesting is when we, we asked uh, of the people that drive alone, what would your, you know, 
Next alternative B to if you weren't driving alone, 49% would choose transit, 35% would choose walking, and 32% would choose biking. And then as, the, as we look at uh, the employee benefits and what employees would value, and this might be an opportunity for our businesses to work with their employee base on, on some of these benefits, to as a community, if we feel that this is important to uh, move in those directions that were indicated earlier in the earlier presentation, is that I guess one thing that isn't so surprising, if we have 83% of people driving alone, uh, one of the most valued uh, benefits for them would be a parking space at 65%. But what I did find interesting was the secure biking. I mean, with only 1% of our, our community biking to work, 49% said some secure uh, bike parking would be important to them. Uh, also, uh, a flexible transportation allowance was around 40%. And um, the other benefit that I think was unique, again, a reserved carpool parking at 16% when really only 2% of the folks in our uh, survey were carpooling. And so that's really what we wanted to share with all of you with the idea that we would be um, doing a survey like this again in, in another year to see how, those, how these numbers uh, either move up or move down. And so I would open it up to any questions that anybody has.